Hello and welcome again to another financial analysis video with myself, Moed Amin, and Ted Wayman. Uh, so the goal of this show is to uh, help you improve your business acumen by helping you better read financial statements. If you understand the finances of a company, you actually understand the character of the business. And precious few people compared with all the professionals out there are able to read financial statements very well. As Warren Buffett said, if you want to understand business, then you've got to understand the language, and that language is finance. So we help you do that by analyzing famous companies. And 98% uh, of those companies are actually made from requests from you, the viewers. And I'll, I'll talk about that later on in, or in a moment, how you can make your request as well. So uh, let's dive in. Uh, we're, today, we're going to be looking at uh, Serco. Now, Serco is a well-known uh, UK business. Uh, they're essentially an outsourcing company, and they outsource services to the public sector. Uh, so think about you know, defense, uh, justice, and immigration, where they will outsource security agents and uh, security tagging equipment, et cetera, uh, in the health sector, the transport sector, as well as what's called citizen services as well. So they, they're a well-known outsourcing company in that respect. Um, they their CEO who, who's actually announced that he's retiring uh, but interestingly for those uh, in both in the UK and any of those abroad who are watching this uh, it's a gentleman called Rupert Soames now Rupert Soames is actually the now his name may not be that well known but his grandfather is and his grandfather was Winston Churchill now he's retiring soon um, but I thought that was interesting to share with everyone um a lot of you will have heard about the uh, situation in the UK recently, where our Prime Minister and Chancellor uh, put out a statement, a mini budget, which kind of sent markets really nervous uh, and caused some problems in, in the gilts of what, what the Americans call treasury markets. And um, Serco was not immune to this situation. In fact, they have a, a pension scheme that's worth one billion pounds. And uh, that was put at risk. And that pension scheme had to then request a loan from the Serco business to the tune of 60 million pounds. So they're not the, they, they were certainly not immune to this. Uh, I think a lot of pension schemes in, in this country have been affected uh, by what's been going on. Um, now, you might want to look in that in more detail yourself. We're not going to be analyzing any of that background detail. We're just interested in the financial statements here. Now, this company was a request from uh, two of our viewers, actually, and um, one of whom had requested two companies, James Fisher as well as Serco. James Fisher, we've actually already completed the analysis and published that video. So if you're interested in looking at that, just type in James Fisher Financial Analysis uh, or type in James Fisher within our playlist and you will find that there. Uh, so thank you, Paul and Philippus for your request. Here is your video. And uh, and you can also make a request. If there's a company that you're interested in, whether you are selling to that company, whether you're thinking about investing in them, or if you're about to go for an interview and want to sound really smart and actually get that job, uh, then uh, leave a note in the comments section. Tell us the name of the company you're interested in and give us some context. The more interesting the context, the higher up the priority list you will go. So um, quick note on the share price and stick around because we're going to talk about the share price as in, in context to the financial analysis that we're going to be conducting. Um, the company IPO'd in 1988. If you invested back then, you'd be sitting on a profit of a, about 567%. Uh, um, I looked at this a couple of days ago, so you might see a different number here on our analysis, which is more recent. So it's about 557% increase. If you invested five years ago, you'd be sitting on a, um, a decrease of 35%. If you invested a year ago, uh, sorry, an increase of 35%. And if you invested a year ago, it'd be an increase of 22%. So definitely some fluctuations going on there. And we'll dig into that further on. So uh, without further ado, Ted, let's share with our viewers what we have analyzed about this company and help them make their own analysis in the future. Okay, good to see you, Moeed. Um, welcome, welcome back to all our subscribers. Welcome uh, to anybody who is new to the channel. And if you are new, please 
please do subscribe hit the button uh, down below wherever it is um uh, and subscribe don't forget to like and share this video maybe send it to your colleagues if you know anybody in circo maybe send it to them um and do um please interact with us so leave your comments if you like what you see um leave a comment if you're not sure you don't like what you see leave a comment um if we've got anything wrong leave a comment obviously um if you are leaving comments though be polite it doesn't cost anything to be polite um so here are the annual report and accounts of circa we're looking at 2021 now there are some half year accounts out as well we're going to be focusing on the annual report and accounts as well if you can read the information here um uh, then you can read the information in the half year 2022 as well um lots of information in these accounts lots of uh, you know the detail about what they really do um, uh, and, 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 and what they're up to. There's our chairman. Um, there is Rupert Soames there, um, uh, as Moeed was mentioning. Um, Winston Churchill, interestingly, our 60th and 62nd prime minister. There's a little bit of informa uh, trivial information for you. Anyway, lots of information about who the company is and kind of all the pies that they've got their fingers into. But we are going to gloss over that uh, and whiz all the way down to the income statement. So through the, um, the compliance activities, through the remuneration report, uh, we'll get to the uh, auditor's report, um, and then we get into the actual financial statement. So uh, 195 uh, of uh, 268 pages, so quite a long way down. So here we go. Uh, um, top line revenue, so the revenue or the sales of the company, there it is. Um, so the revenue of this business, they are turning over, uh, we're in pounds, millions. So 4,000 million is 4.4 billion pounds. So there we go. 4.4 billion pounds is their sales. Um, and, and that'll be the kind of, you know, what they are charging the government. And then the cost of sales is the cost of the service that they are providing, uh, 3.9 billion uh, leaving them with a 468 gross profit. Now that's relatively low. Um, so that gross profit margin is about 11%, which basically says for every pound they bill the UK government, it's costing them 89p to actually provide that service. So this is not high margin um, a, a game. And that kind of makes me feel uh, reasonably comfortable as a taxpayer, because if they were making uh, excess excessively large profits, um, uh, I would not be uh, overly happy, especially um, in the current financial climate. So gross profit for uh, 468 million pounds, about 11 percent. They've then got um, the costs of running the business, which is 243 million pounds. So that'll be all their, uh, their overheads, kind of rent rate, light heat, HR team, finance team, sales, marketing, um, uh, facilities, IT, board of directors, remuneration, all that kind of stuff. And, and there's a few other bits and pieces in terms of the overheads. Anyway, operating profit, 216 million pounds. There it is, there's the operating profit, 260 million pounds, about 5%. So they're only getting to keep 5p after, um, uh, you know, for, for every pound that they bill the government. You'll notice if finance costs are actually pretty small. So this suggests to me that they've got very little debt sitting on the balance sheet um, and what debt they do have um, they can afford, leaving them with a profit before tax of 192. Interestingly enough, also they get a tax refund in this year. So um, don't expect to see that on a regular basis. So we're going to see this profit figure is probably a little bit high. I don't know why they get a tax credit. Um, they got a tax charge in the previous year. Um, so, uh, you know, that 303 million sounds like a bit of a one off. Um, and in a normal uh, state of affairs, uh, they'd be paying, you know, uh, uh, tax at about corporation tax of, uh, well, it was 19 percent. It's now gone up to about 26 percent. Um, uh, so you, you'd be sort of you know, ending up with tax, uh, you know, profit after tax of about 80 million in a kind of normalized world. OK, so just to, just to highlight that, that um, uh, the profit figure looks quite high for this uh, for this period. So nothing really to sort of, you know, exceptional going on in the um, in the income statement. It's obviously a, a, it's a low margin business. Um, it's a low, uh, uh, you know, quite a low um, uh, profitability business. Um, if we go and have a look at the balance sheet, interesting enough, they give the statement to move to equity before the balance sheet. But I don't think we should read too much into that. Um, so the balance sheet, um, looking at the assets, first of all, 2.7 billion of assets, um, 1.8 billion of 
non-current assets so these are the things that we need to run the business uh, and you'll see that really you know that's the kind of these are the big numbers here so property plant and equipment relatively small right of use assets is effectively property plant and equipment which is leased okay so that kind of photocopier which is on a higher purchase in the corner that's going to be in what we call the right of use assets that's a kind of new statement bringing these assets uh, onto the balance sheet um, so they've got a reasonable number of um, right of use assets this will be all their kind of you know uh, furniture for example and, and, and laptops um, quite a lot of goodwill here uh, goodwill increasing um, uh, and this suggests that these guys have been growing through um, acquisition so goodwill arises on acquisition of another business um, it's not something you can you, know, you can't you can't take that asset itself put it on ebay and sell it so it's very much a kind of a nominal valuation um, uh, it arises on the difference between what you pay for a company and the fair value of the net assets um, i don't think you necessarily need to know about that but it just shows me that you know these guys you know they are a conglomeration of organizations uh, and quite often you know in order to gain contracts they'll buy the company that has the contract contract and then kind of amalgamate them into the kind of the whole Circo offering. Um, in terms of the current assets, um, so quite interesting down here, we've got so um, a very little inventory because they're selling a service rather than, than stuff, so to speak. Um, uh, but they do have these contract assets. And I'm not sure exactly what the contract assets are. But what's interesting is that there's a kind of uh, on the other side, we see contract liabilities. So um, contract assets may well be um, uh, some form of, uh, uh, you know, honestly, I, I, I don't know exactly what they're kind of, you know, they're looking at in terms of those contract assets. And, uh, and maybe, um, you know, the Note 21 would, would, would tell us a little bit more. But, you know, that's telling us um, that they have these, you know, these contracts with the government um, and that part of that contract can be recognised as an asset, but then there is a liability uh, sitting alongside that. Trade and other receivables, um, uh, relatively straightforward. Um, and trade and other payables on the current uh, liability side. Um, what is quite interesting about these guys is that uh, if you look at this business here, uh, if you compare the current assets with the current liabilities, um, that's a traditional warning sign. Now, that wasn't a warning sign in the previous year. So uh, the traditional kind of uh, uh, lineup is to sort of look at um, current assets. That's things that we own, that we are trying to turn into cash or already are cash and our current liabilities amounts we owe and have to pay soon. Uh, and we notice that the ratio is below one. So that's a little bit of an alarm bell that says, um, you know, there's a, you know, maybe there's a few um, uh, issues. They've got a reasonable amount of cash, but liquidity um, is, 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 a, is a potential concern. Let's put it like that. Um, so interesting enough, if you look at that working capital and you run your working capital requirement, um, uh, you know, it, it's it's you know we kind of need to look at the um uh, the uh, uh, we need to look at the um uh, the cash flow to, to make sure that they are generating cash and make sure they can afford um uh, that low uh, uh, liquidity ratio. But that's that's a little bit of a concern to me. On the current liabilities, non-current liabilities, we've got some loans. There they are. So I'm um, not a huge amount of loans. Um, so their their uh, loan is um. Uh, you know, relatively small compared with the total size of the balance sheet. So they've got about 377 million in loans um, and the total equity in the business. There we go to scroll down a little bit. There's the total equity, which is the shareholders funds. Um, lease obligations, those will be the lease obligations uh, alongside the right of use assets. So there's a kind of matching process that we can match those with the assets that we were looking at earlier. Um, uh, the loans are funding the business um, and we've got, you know, this this trade and other payables, reasonable, uh, reasonable size government, not very good at paying. So I um, may indicate a few cash flow challenges there. Company's been profitable. Uh, it's got retained earnings um, uh, and uh, it has also been paying out dividends, as we will see in a minute. So if we look at the movement in equity. Here's the movement in equity. We're looking at the retained earnings section here. Um, uh, they made a profit in the previous year. And then in this year, they also made a profit and you'll notice they paid out dividends in 2021, didn't pay dividends in 2020, probably uh, with the pandemic um, uh, looking to kind of hold on to cash uh, due to the uncertainty uh, that that year actually brought. In terms of the cash flow, um, so the cash flow, just um, for, for the note for the cash flow, that um, the, the, they're generating a positive cash flow. And this is a pretty good 
um, cash flow, 350 million. Uh, so that's the sort of the cash equivalent of their operating profit, so to speak. Um, so the, um, uh, or, or, you know, effectively their, their EBITDA, so to speak. Um, so operating cash flow, 350, EBITDA is about 372. Um, so they are generating, you know, they are profitable, they are generating cash. We need to look at note 36 to find out um, the reconciliation. So those of you who are familiar uh, with these uh, videos, um, uh, you know, usually we get the reconciliation from the profit and loss account through to the cash flow in the um, top of the cash flow statement. Um, but these guys have put it in note 20, uh, uh, 36. So if we just whiz down quickly to note 36, here it is. Um, uh, and we can find that kind of that reconciliation. So here's the reconciliation. Profit before tax is 192. Uh, uh, there's the operating profit of 216. Um, the cash profit is, uh, we'll just scroll down. For, uh, uh, let's just uh, zoom out a little bit so we can actually see that. Hold on a sec. Um, so we can see all the numbers on one page. There we go. Um, so what we've got is our operating profit. Um, uh, and there is the net cash flow. Um, and what we can see here is um, sort of non-cash items. Uh, so things like depreciation, for example, that being added back as the non-cash items. And then there's this little bit of movement in working capital. Now, there's not a huge amount of movement in working capital, and that's good. OK, so they're not seeing a massive increase in payables, for example. They're not seeing a massive increase um, in receivables, which is uh, causing distortions in their cash flow. So cash flow looks pretty reasonable. Uh, return to our cash flow statement here. So pretty strong cash flows coming through. Uh, easily enough cash flows to pay for their investing activities. Um, so here you'll notice, if you remember, goodwill increased. Well, that's why goodwill increased. So they, they made a purchase of a subsidiary. So these guys, they don't really need to spend a lot on property, plant and equipment. You can see the um, uh, the uh, the purchase of property, plant and equipment. In fact, we can't even see the property, plant and equipment um, uh, in there. So, um, uh, yeah, so purchase of property, plant and equipment is is not not a huge amount because, you know, they're providing a service to the government. They don't need lots of stuff. Um, so they don't need a huge amount of investment. You'll notice the previous year um, they actually generated cash uh, from their um, uh, from selling uh, stuff that they didn't need anymore. So they're selling a bit of property, plant and equipment and buying a little bit of property, plant and equipment. So these guys are not, you know, the, the significant investment there is the purchase of another company. Uh, and you can find out uh, which company that is uh, by looking at note seven, for example. Uh, and so then from the financing of the business, um, what we see here, the financing uh, negative 250. So what are the big numbers there? They're repaying loans. So they're trying to reduce their loans. They've got some loans coming in, but on a net basis, there's a little bit of refinancing going on. But on a net basis, they are reducing their loans. And they're paying leases as well. So those lease payments on those right of use assets is probably their biggest cost. Um, uh, and then the dividends um, uh, we uh, uh, mentioned earlier. And they've also done a bit of a share buyback um, as well. So for uh, 40.7 um, million of own shares repurchased. That's a kind of, you know, a, a, a share buyback going on there. So there is the um, uh, the kind of the, the performance of the company. Um, it's looking pretty reasonable, I have to admit. I mean, it's it's. You know, there's no sort of real warning signs apart from that liquidity ratio, which, you know, just looks like, you know, as soon as it dips below one, it just makes me a little bit nervous. Um, so but I think the kind of the big challenge for these guys and, and, and we'll kind of see that in the um, uh, in the uh, share price here. So if we look at the share price, um, it's kind of, you know, it's off the boil a little bit. I think the real challenge that they're going to have, you know, they've been basically going sideways for the last you know, X number of years. Um, the real challenge that they're going to have is that, you know, these guys are contracted to the government to provide the service um, and the government uh, expenditure is under massive pressure at the moment. So these guys, you know, there's going to be a big kickback in trying to reduce the amount of money that they are paying uh, and uh, eliminating um, uh, services which really aren't necessary. Um, so these guys, you know, there's going to be a constant, I mean, I think, you know, working with the government, there's always a constant sort of challenge of being able to, um, you know, sort of, you know, up your sales. But, you know, certainly um, uh, for these guys, I think that's going to be, um, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge that they face going forward. So if we look at the P ratio now, um, if you take the, the, um, the, the market cap, 
um, which is uh, about just shy of two billion pounds. Um, if you compare that to the earnings uh, for this year um, that we were just looking at 2001, you're looking at about six times earnings. Um, but don't forget the earnings for 2001 were kind of distorted by that big tax credit that was credited back to them. Um, so I think a P ratio of 12.53 um, is much more reasonable. So that's about a 6% um, yield, six, probably a 7%, 7, maybe even 8% yield, um, which is reasonably good. Um, dividend yield is 2%. Don't forget they've got share buybacks as well, though. So I would probably include that as well. So, you know, it's not it's not cheap. It's not expensive. It's it's kind of what it is. So, um, you know, I'm not necessarily saying this is a screaming buy. I'm not sure it's a screaming sell. I think it's, you know, if you've got it in your portfolio, it's probably a screaming hold. And it sounds, you know, pretty boring company, pretty boring share price. Um, uh, and that's probably what we want from somebody like Circa. We want somebody who's just, you know, reliable, solid, and is going to provide the service um, that they're contracted uh, for um, on an ongoing basis. Um, and there you go, Moe. That's kind of my that's my take on it. Um, I'm not sure I'm really able to kind of add a huge amount um, uh, to the uh, kind of the analysis, but hopefully uh, a few people have found that useful. Yeah, that, that seemed useful to me. And uh, like I said before, purpose of these videos is to um, show people how to read and analyze and draw conclusions from financial statements, or certainly when they read something in financial statements, are there any further questions that we need to find answers to? And we've done that there. So hopefully that's helped you. So when you look at any future statements, whether it's Serco, another company industry, or any other company, you're able to read those financial statements more quickly and more confidently. So thank you for that. If any of you have any other companies you would like us to analyze, again, do leave a note in the comment section. And as always, like, share, subscribe. We'll see you on the next video. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, everyone else. Good to see you, my week. Catch you later. So I hope you enjoyed that video and found it useful and informative. Now, if you want to know more about uh, what I do, then you can visit Talk Financials and find out about the training workshops uh, and the clients uh, that I work with. And the QR code uh, is on your screen right now. If you are interested in being able to do this yourself, to do some uh, financial analysis, there's a couple of resources. There is an online workshop. Uh, it's available on my website or you can click on the QR code and it'll stay, take you straight through uh, to this online workshop uh, where you can learn to read and understand and interpret financial information yourself. Alternatively, there is a book available at all good bookstops, particularly a very big online one. And the QR code, once again, will take you through to the opportunity to buy the book. Uh, and there is also a Kindle edition. Um, Otherwise, that's everything from me. Please, please, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe uh, to the channel. More subscribers uh, uh, makes it uh, uh, means that you're going to get um, notification um, about uh, new videos coming up uh, and also the opportunity to you know, ask questions and do recommend any videos uh, or sorry, any companies that you'd like me uh, to analyze for you. Um, I think we've got a couple of uh, suggested next videos coming up. Uh, so please do uh, take the opportunity, have a look at the other videos uh, and don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel. And I will see you on the next video.